So I want to talk about, um, I'm going to talk a bit about, uh, well, the title of this message is The Four Types of Backsliders, and you're going to see why that's so important. Um, let me say, by the way, that a lot of the stuff I've been teaching in recent years, I've been learning from other people, and particularly one Bishop Doug Hayward Mills, uh, because he's one of those few movement leaders, global movement leaders, who actually writes. And so I've, I've had a chance to read many of his books. And so even the topic of backsliding was something that I was clued on by him, that it's important to teach your church about this. And so the four types of backsliders is something I learned from reading a book that he wrote. And, um, you know, even as we've looked at reasons for why people backslide, maybe it's important to understand the psychology of a backslider. I think it's important to understand what happens to you by the time you get to that place the psychology of backsliding. So let me talk about that first, and then I'll come and talk about the four types of backsliders. And there's the, the, the thing about the psychology of backsliding is people think that it can't happen to them. You know, people think it can't happen to them. But it's important to understand it can happen to anybody. Be worried. <laughs> Your enemy, he's prowling around, seeking who he may devour. He's watched you. By the way, there are some people who are doing such great things for the kingdom, and the enemy has a long game. Satan doesn't, he plays chess, he doesn't play drafts. So he, he's thinking ahead. So if you're not thinking ahead, you're a victim. Because your success is today, you don't understand. He can even let you win for the sake of your downfall. If he sees a, if he sees a weakness in you, in your character especially, I notice that what Satan does is he allows you to build your ministry. Because he knows the day you will fall, you will bring a great many people down with you. If, if, he, if he made me backslide 15 years ago, just after starting Mavuno, not so many people would be impacted. But if he saw a crack in me and decided, let me let him grow because I know where to come and hit, the number of people who would be impacted to do would be much greater. So it's so important for you to understand that just the fact that you're succeeding doesn't mean you're proof of failing. Yeah? The fact that you're seeing people being healed, the fact that you're seeing miracles, doesn't mean that you're immune. Wow. It could just mean that there's an equilibrium. There's a way that you've been allowed to succeed for the sake of future downfall. So wow. it's important for you to understand how backsliders think so that you never find yourself in that position. So we're going to talk about the psychology of backsliding. And the thing about people who are in a backsliding stage, many times you find them thinking uh, in a very interesting way. Um, so psychology of backsliding, I'm not alone. I'm not alone. Koengi. To Koengi. <laughs> it's been said that misery loves company. Or it's also been said that there is safety in numbers. And I've noticed that human beings are very good at taking comfort in the fact that other people are in the same or similar situation. For example, if you got a D in school, it's not a good thing to get a D in an exam. And of course, you'd be heartbroken. But then if you went to school the next day and you found that almost everybody in class got a D or an E or an F, you'd be like, ah, wow. I, got, I even got a D. <laughs> Many people had Fs. All of a sudden, your psychology has changed. Instead of thinking about how horrible it is that you have a D, now you're thinking, we are many. <laughs> in fact, I'm even doing good compared to my friends. Yeah? That is the psychology. Uh, of a, you know, it's like you find out that, hey, my goodness, everybody else failed, we are many. It's like those people who go to a meeting and they're running because they're late, then they arrive and find, oh, no one else has come. Oh, I thought I was late. <laughs> Do you know people like that? Okay, some of you are exactly like that. That's why you're not saying you know people like that. It's like because I'm the only one, I'm, the, I'm one of the first, so I can't be late, even though it means we are all late. Being one of the first to arrive doesn't make you on time. You're all late. And this attitude, by the way, is very common among people who are backsliding. You might hear people say things like, by the way, nowadays, not many people don't go to church nowadays. Most people even watch online, you know? Uh, city life is too busy for, for regular church attendance. I don't even understand. I think culture has changed. The church should get with it. I mean, everybody drinks wine or beer with their food nowadays. It's not a big deal. Uh, you know, we used to say back in the day, uh, it, maybe hell won't be so bad. I mean, Michael Jackson, Whitney Houston, all the big guys will be there anyway. Tutakua wengi will be many of us. Have you ever heard people talk like this? 
The problem with this attitude is that when the crash comes, being many will not help. I sometimes marvel in Kenyan highways, for those who are not from Kenya, Kenyan highways will teach you a very interesting thing about this psychology. Because you'll always find people having that where there's safety in numbers. Thicker Road, Mombasa Road. And then you wait, you find guys crowd, it's like they build a big blob of people until you're like 30, 40, then they now run across the road together. And their psychology is telling them we're too many to hit. I often think that perhaps what they should be thinking is we are too many to miss. Like, if a truck comes and hits the 40 of you, being many will not save you. Actually, in fact, it might even be worse for you. Because in addition to hitting tarmac, you will be hitting many of you. And you might even get infected by other people's... Okay, sorry, it's a horrible picture, I know. But it's the truth. Safety in numbers is a myth. When the calamity comes, it's actually a myth. When you compare yourself with others, you don't know what they're thinking. You don't know where they're from. You know those kids in high school where you used to hang out with them and they're just there chatting with everybody and having fun and talking, enjoying life, having coffee with everybody. And, and then when the exams come, pass, I mean, and when exams come and you'll see your name, you're over here. And that kid you thought you're failing together is up there. And it's like they were laughing with everyone else. In fact, when everybody would, would be like, ah, me, I can't even show you my grades. I've done bad leave. And then they're like, yeah, even me, I can't show you my grades. <laughs> You thought you were together. Then you realize they're going to national school. You're being left to decide what to do with your future. Wow. I mean, that's the way psych the psychology of we're, we're together. It doesn't work. Uh, it's all, all those other kids in our school. We had those kids who, yes, we are all together and we all fail. But you didn't understand that their parents had a plan to take them to the UK for their, for their degree. With their poor grades. And you are left here trying to ngangana with national exam board to figure out what your future is. And the child was ready. In fact, the minute the exam ended, they entered a plane and they left you here, thinking we are together. Are you understanding what I'm saying? The psychology of we're together, it really doesn't work. It's a myth that there's safety in numbers. Hebrews 9.27, it says, Just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes judgment, after that comes judgment, you will stand before God, not as a crowd, but as an individual. You need to know that. Every one of us will be judged separately. And there's no safety in numbers. So I think that that's one thing that I feel like I see people fool. It's like, look, so-and-so backs lead as well. So-and-so doesn't go to church. It's just a thing nowadays. It's our generation. Many of us don't go to church. Many of us don't identify. So I must be okay. It's a dangerous one. Number two, psychology. I have lots of time. I have lots of time. Uh, it's very interesting because people think they have lots of time. They get into this space where it begins to feel very unrealistic, the truths of Scripture. If you ever find people who say they have lots of time, okay, I don't have lots of time, please just use this thing again. They, they keep telling me, try it first time, it might work this time. It didn't. <laughs> when Pastor Kilonzi and Pastor Kuria preach, it will work, I'm sure. But me, I, I know Jesus is coming soon, I cannot preach the whole afternoon. <laughs> I have lots of time. It gets very unscientific to think. You know, people think about, what do you mean Jesus is coming soon? He's never come back. There are people who thought Jesus was coming even when the Romans were sacking Jerusalem, when Hitler was killing people. People, I'm sure, thought it was the last days. The Antichrist had come. Then it ended. The war ended. And here they are. When COVID came, how many people thought the world had ended? It's like you're waiting for the clouds to part and Jesus to come back. And then COVID ended and here we are. <laughs> and so it's very easy to get to the place where you start feeling, you know what? I mean, there's lots of time. Nothing serious is going to actually happen. Uh, and there's no sense of urgency. This is a very common thing in our generation of Christians, that we feel, you know what? We have all the time in the world. I mean, the likelihood of Jesus coming in my time are so narrow. Why my generation? And we don't actually believe he's going to come back soon. We forget that Jesus actually compared his coming to a thief in the night. And he said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 and 3, For you know well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, while people are saying, peace and safety. Destruction will come on them suddenly, as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. You know, a pregnant woman is, she can be due, 
And one moment everything is fine, the next minute she's in labor. Like things can change. If you're, by the way, I'm always nervous when I'm around a pregnant woman at about eight, nine months. Because you can just be shaking hands and then something changes. <laughs> I, I don't know if you've ever heard those stories of guys who are in the three sitting next to the pregnant woman and then you ended up becoming an obsgin with no training. Because it's like, now you're the one saying push. What you've seen in the movie, what? I'm like, Lord, that's a nightmare. Never, I never want to be the guy in that matatu. You know what I mean? It's like for a guy that just freaks you out. It's not the thing you ever want to do. But it says that that's the way Jesus is coming back. You're going to be sitting there saying peace. In fact, tomorrow we're going to be doing this, we're going to be doing that, and then boom, labor has come. Jesus is in the clouds, and it's too late. Everything has changed. And the world will be in complete and unimaginable chaos. I mean, it's interesting because, yes, the COVID crisis did pass, but do you remember how it felt like in the middle? What well, you're thinking, how could we be that generation that stayed home for three years? Like, our parents never went through that. Our grandparents never went through that. I remembered maybe the Europeans in the World War must have felt something similar. It's like everything just stopped. And you became the generation that nobody had ever experienced. You went through what other people had not experienced. And that's the way the world can change, just like this. And that feeling that nothing is going to shift, you know, life won't change, it's such a false sense of security. I remember one day I got... I was, I, was, I, was, I was going for a meeting, a very, very important meeting with some, some uh, partners of Nairobi Chapel, and I served there. And I, I remember it was one of those ones where I, you cannot miss. You don't miss this meeting. I'd planned for it for a while, got my notes in, ready, got everything in place, and I was going. But the day before, I played a game of squash. And I played with my good friend, and somewhere in the middle of the game of squash, I fell down, and just at the end. And I got up, and I felt, I felt a bit sore when I finished the game got into the car, drove home, and I remember the next morning, my leg was swollen, and I was thinking, ah, what is this? Like, this is so inconveniencing, not a good time to be sick. I really wanted to go straight to the meeting and go to the hospital afterwards. My wife told me, no, 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 go now. Like, it's important for you to just get it checked. She was a bit nervous. So I got in the car, drove myself to uh, Aga Khan Hospital, and I remember getting in, and the doctor being called to come and look, and I'm thinking, I have a meeting, a very important meeting. And these guys move quickly. Fortunately, it was meeting, uh, morning, so the, driver, the, the doctor, I saw him very quickly, came and looked at my leg, was concerned, pressed a few places, I felt a bit of pain, and then he said, I need to admit you right now. <laughs> exactly, that's exactly, I was like, what do you mean, admit me? I drove myself here, are you mad? And the guy said, uh, I really do need to admit you. It was a lady. And I remember saying, uh, you don't understand, I have a meeting, I can come back, we discuss admission afterwards. <laughs> I have a very important meeting. And, and uh, the lady said, you, I really do need to detain you. I said, you can't detain me, I have a meeting. So she brought a form and said, I need you to sign here. And I asked, what's that? She said, it's a, what's that form? It's a disclaimer form. So that if anything happens to you after this, I am not responsible for you. And I was a bit nervous. I said, what do you mean? What's going on? And she said, let me call a specialist. And she just called the guy. And the guy happened to be there. So he showed up, an older guy. He looked at the leg, he says, admit him now. <laughs> And I said, what, what are you guys talking about? And he said, your tendon yesterday when you fell actually snapped. And what's holding it right now is a little string. And if it separates, your leg will take a many, many years to heal. We need to actually do emergency surgery to reattach the tendon while we still can. And you can't go for your meeting. And I remember just being very shaky. I called my assistant. I said, please, you know, I had this meeting. It's a very important meeting. I have it on my behalf. And the lady said, yeah, yeah, got it. And I went into surgery, and they put me under. It was actually general anesthesia. I had a proper, I mean, I'm calling my wife to say, by the way, I'm going for surgery. <laughs> <laughs> and I woke up, and I had a cast till here. And my leg was suspended. And they told me, um, you will not be able to go to work for the next three months. Uh, you need to get your wife to come and drive you home. And they said, uh, and after that, you'll need six, month, six more months with a cast. Like, just like that, my life changed. I called the office. They told me, oh, we had the meeting. The, the guys were very happy. In fact, we've already signed everything. Uh, don't even worry. We've got this. And they moved on like I didn't exist. <laughs> yeah. By the way, for the three months I was away, the church went on. Nobody died, the church grew, everything happened. 
in my absence. Can you believe it? <laughs> I could not believe it. They didn't even miss me. In fact, I think they took a few days to come and visit me. They were so busy doing their things. But in the meantime, my leg was up for the next three months. My wife can tell you, I used to shower with a bug. You get those laundry bugs and put it over here. Because I, mean, I was just incapacitated. Life can change like this. Yeah, I know you have plans for tomorrow. You don't know whether tomorrow you'll be here. It's just the reality. So this thinking of we have time. There's so much time to get things right. We don't know. None of us has time. The only time you have responsibility over is now. now. Even five minutes from now, you have no idea what could have happened. And so I think that's a very important, it's a very false thinking to think that there must be time, that there will be time. Another way of thinking for backsliders is there must be a shortcut. Surely this thing is too hard. There must be a shortcut. We know we live in a shortcut world. Nowadays there's an app for everything. Uh, you can use AI. There's even apps to do homework. Yeah, there's apps, to, there's apps to write a book for you. You can even write a book with an app, by the way. You can do practically everything with an app. As, an, as a generation, we want to do it fast, and we don't care much about process. And unfortunately, many Christians approach their faith the same way. We figure that God, God must have shortcuts. He's too loving to make thing, this thing hard. I mean, there's too much. This, this whole thing of Sijui fasting 21 days, what is that? Surely, see, I'll still go to heaven whether I fast or not. By this, you'll still go to heaven. Yeah. I mean, what's the big deal? Why do I have to push so hard? Why do I have to do these things that everybody else is doing? God can't be so harsh as to allow me to go to hell. Surely he must consider that at least I showed up. You know, nowadays in schools, they give medals for participation. <laughs> Some of you have kids who, went, who go to those schools. You know, back in the day, there was a winner, number one, number two, number three. The rest of us, mujaribu next time, try next time. <laughs> Nowadays, they have certificates for every child, participation. You all won. Everyone's a winner. And so we start to think that way as Christians, that God surely, I mean, God is good all the time. So surely, it must be, there must be an easy way. And the problem here is that we forget that when saying that God is good means that, yes, God is perfectly loving, but God is also perfectly just. Yeah. I'll give you an example. If you ever found a, a judge who was so loving that he constantly let off murderers who were supposed to be sentenced, that judge would not be a loving, a, a good judge. He'd be an incompetent judge. God is not an incompetent judge. Wow. He's good, yes, but he is just. And many times as Christians in this generation, we've forgotten this thing called the justice of God, that God is a just God. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. It says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. There's actually going to, there's a limit to God's mercy. Yeah. God is merciful, super merciful. But there's a time when mercy will not be enough. And the justice checks in. We're living in the age of God's mercy, by the way. But that age will come to an end in that sense. When God will show us that he's not just perfectly loving, but he's also perfectly just. Fourth attitude of a box, backslider. And I'm giving you this just to help you because this is how people think. There's, a, there's just that sense many times when people are backsliding. I've done my time. I've done my time. This one we talked about earlier. People who've been Christians for a long time. And in their heyday, they loved God passionately. They gave lots of time. They served him. Uh, in ministry, but as their responsibilities increased, they moved on to a different stage. Career demands, demands of marriage and kids, and now they feel more like retired Christians compared to where they used to be. I mean, they had fire for God, they were passionate for God, they did crazy things for God, but today they live measured lives, a measured Christianity. It's like we served God in our own time, and now it's time to look after our business. This is very common among Christians. And the problem is, it's unbiblical. There is no such thing as a retired Christian. Your life is a dot compared to what eternity God has for you. And, and you, if you retire now, what are you going to do the rest of eternity? It's like you're just beginning. This is your infancy. It's the infancy of your faith. This is the time for you to grow and to serve God and to extend yourself for Him. Christians don't retire. I mean, I love the example of Pastor James's grandfather. I have, gran I have a grandfather who lived exactly the same way, serving God until the last moment. 
we don't retire, we get better. Wow. Yeah. By the way, my, my desire is at 60, I'll be 10 times more fruitful than I am now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'll be impacting 10 times the number of people I'm impacting now. I desire to grow. I want to be more fruitful. Every year God gives me, I want that to be a year of increased fruitfulness. I want to do things for God I've never done. Go to places I've never been. I want to serve him in greater ways every year that he gives me life. Because I know it's a privilege for me to be on earth. It's a privilege for me to serve by faith. In heaven, there's no need for faith because he's there. <laughs> but now there's faith and I have an opportunity to grow in faith. I want to be like Caleb who said, give me my mountain when I'm 85 if the Lord allows me to live till 85. But I also want to be that guy who says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Today as we surrendered, one of the things I told God is I love my life. If you want it, it's yours. Even if I die at 53, I'm so grateful for the 53 years I've had. By the way, I'm not talking in a, this is how I believe. Like, if I, if I die today, I'm going to be with Jesus. I'll even see my father who served him. So for me to die is gain. But the reason I'm here is for you. It's because I need to grow your faith and strengthen you while I'm here. I won't always be here. But God has given me a privilege and opportunity to serve people while I'm here. It's actually better for me to die and be with Christ. <laughs> you see, most Christians don't believe that. That's why they're looking sad. <laughs> you think the earth is better than, where, than what God has called you to. It's not. It's a lie. But you know, we've been fooled. And so because of that, we are so earthbound. But when God sets you free, you begin to realize, actually, I live for something bigger, which is how I become unshakable. Because the place I'm going, if you try and kill me, what you'll do is you'll kill my body, but you can't kill my soul. And that's what allowed Christians to stand against the Nazi regime. Because they know you can torture my body, but my body is just that. It's a body. The spirit was created for something much greater. And when I know that, then it's like, hey, there's no turning back. I'm going to serve God with everything I have. Because I understand there's something much bigger at stake. So may you serve God with passion on your 85. Amen. Hey, I see you at 85 serving God. I see you as an ancestor of faith. Yeah. I see people being blessed by you. Your family generation thanking God for you. I see people in your family, nieces and nephews and grandchildren saying there was an ancestor. At this, there was before this person and after this person. Something shifted in our family because of this person. Just the same way that Pastor James says about his family. I see that happening in your family as well. Amen. This is what God wants for every single one of us. So I want to just move now to what I want to talk about, which is the types of backsliders. And I'm not telling you this because of backsliders. I'm telling you this because of you. Because every one of us has a responsibility. If you love me, feed my sheep. Yeah, feed my sheep. How do we feed God's sheep and avoid the devil from devastating the ranks of the church, of the righteous, of God's people? In the three parables of Luke 15, Jesus talked about four types of backsliders. Four types of backsliders in one parable. And he talked about the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost younger son, and the lost older son. So there are four types of backsliders there. So let's look at each of them in turn. The first is the lost sheep. The lost sheep. And the lost sheep for me stands for that person who backslid, and one of the accentuating factors was lack of fellowship. Lack of people who stood by them to pull them back when they were backsliding. We look at the reasons they backslide, that's different. But now we're looking at some of the things around them that could have helped them stay and not backslide. The lost sheep is a picture of a believer who strayed away from the church, strayed because he lacked fellowship. And today it could represent a person who was alone in a place where there was no good church or there was no fellowship to pull him back. Maybe he was in church but not, not connected to a discipleship group slowly became isolated without even realizing it. Pursuing different interests, maybe business or studies, no one noticed that they were no longer as passionate about Jesus. No one noticed that they were no longer coming to church regularly. No one noticed that they were no longer talking about Jesus in their regular conversation. Nobody was there to notice when it happened. You know, the world, the way it caused, you've heard about the frog, and the way to, to boil a frog. I don't know why anybody would want to boil a frog, but if you ever want to boil a frog, <laughs> they, they tell you the way to do it is put it in nice water, in a kettle, let it swim around happily, and then very slowly start to add the temperature. And slowly add the temperature. And the frog will never know. It's just swimming happily. 
feeling like it's in a sauna. Oh, wow, now I'm even sweating. Nice. This exercise is so sweet. It has no idea it's being cooked alive. By the time it realizes, it will be roasted. You know, it will be ready for someone to eat if you like eating frogs. I've never eaten frogs. <laughs> Although I know there are people who do. Frog chemsha. Uh, frog chemsha. <laughs> frog boiro. <laughs> if you ever want to eat a frog, that's how I hear they do it, if you want to cook it alive. But you know, that's what happens, is that they were slowly boiled alive, and there was no one to tell them, hey, there's a fire. Get out. And there are many lost sheep Christians in our churches today. Every one of our campuses has Christians who are slowly being boiled alive by the culture. They are just excited about their job. They don't even understand. This is a secularizing appointment. Wow. Do you know they're secularizing appointments? Yeah. They're jobs you get. And maybe the job itself would have been good if you had the right attitude. But because of the way you are thinking, that job is actually the thing that is slowly drawing you away from your faith. And now you find yourself talking differently. You're talking like the colleagues at work more than the people that you came from. You're forgetting who you are. You're beginning to think like somebody in the world. And very soon, it's like the car next to you in the parking lot is actually what defines you. And all of a sudden, you're thinking, I need a car so I, I can fit in and not look like I stand out in the workplace. And I need to dress like the people in the workplace. And I need to think like the people in the workplace. Otherwise, I'll look odd. And their, their faith is slowly being boiled alive. It's a slow fade, and nobody saw it coming. Eventually, they're gone. What do we need to do about lost ship believers? Because lost ship believers are very vulnerable. A disconnected ship is very vulnerable to being lost. You know, many times we're quick to criticize those sheep, to say that they shouldn't have wandered off on their own. They shouldn't have listened to voices of false shepherds, etc. But what God is looking for is shepherds after his own heart, who will go and visit those sheep. Go and look after them. Remember the shepherd, the good shepherd is the one who leaves the 99 and goes to where that one is lost and has the conversation and draws them back. I believe we must as a church be passionate about those lost people in our DGs. Having those conversations, people in our church, being able to say, I really think you need to join discipleship group. If only all, all that is happening at Lavington is Pastor Curry announcing DG next week. Come on guys, join, join, join. And you're just there enjoying. You're not an advocate for it. You're actually one of those shepherds that is letting people disappear wow. from the church. It can't just be the pastor. You need to be saying to a friend, I need you to join our DG. I need you to join our discipleship group. It's a place where we grow each other in faith. I need you to grow. We must all become shepherds who feed God's sheep. Look at your neighbor say, if you love him, feed his sheep. Yeah, yeah visit. If somebody doesn't come for discipleship group, go and visit them. Don't just call them and say, we missed you. Go visit them. Especially if you notice there's a, there's a cooling down in their faith. Go and say, what's happening? I've noticed you're no longer as excited about Jesus. Let's be that kind of church that doesn't let people be slowly boiled away in their faith because there's nobody there to offer fellowship. There's nobody to call them back. The second one is the lost silver coin. The lost silver coin. And this one is the one where the, the, the accelerating factor was a loss, a lack of discipleship. A lack of discipleship. You see, the lost coin could have been lost for a variety of reasons. Maybe it was the failure of the woman to secure her coins. And it probably was. This woman is a picture of the church. That many times we are careless in taking care of our coins. The lost coin for me shows a failure of discipleship. And by the way, let me just say, this is one that is very close to my heart. Many times people have asked me, Pastor M, why are you changing Mavuno? Why are you changing our Mavuno? We like it the way it is. It, it, it works for us. And by the way, what I tell them is, this is not the first time I've changed Mavuno. And probably not the last time. As long as the Lord allows me to be alive. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I know that sounds really bad. But it, it, if I'm following Jesus... I don't think Jesus ever allows you to stay static. True. He wants you to keep growing deeper and deeper. But, but you know, many times I say the reason for me, the biggest motivation for this big change right now is because I feel like we must get to the heart of discipleship. We can't have people wandering off and we're not here looking after them. We can't be careless about the people God brings to us. We can't be that woman who just loses the coins that have been given to her. You know, it's very interesting. We've had many people come to Mavuno and do Mizizi, and right now I can't tell you where they are. 
I'm that woman. We're that woman. And people have been lost on our watch because there was nobody caring for their soul. Discipleship is not a course you do. Have you done, Ms. Easy? Discipleship is a person who cares for you, a person who's your shepherd, a person who you call a spiritual parent and who brings you up. By the way, if my child went missing even one day, trust me, I would know. If any of my three children was missing, I would, be the, I would stop everything I'm doing. Aha! I don't care which important meeting I have. Forget important meeting. My son is missing. I will go and look for him. I, I, am, I, am I speaking for somebody here? Yeah. Everything would stop. I don't care if Bill Gates himself is in Mavuno Church. We wanting to give Mavuno Church $5 billion. I would even say stay with your $5 billion. I need my son. That's what a parent does. And that's what was, was lacking that allowed sheep to be lost. Because people would do no, and then it would be like, cheers. And let's do the next door. And I say, the reason why for me, changing Mavuno was not an option is because I could not take it on my conscience that people were being lost on my watch. Not, not on my watch. I mean, let me give you an example. We've got such great tools known across the world. Mizizi is a fantastic tool. Many churches are using Mizizi, by the way, globally. Um, I just spoke to a church yes, uh, the day before yesterday or recently, this last week, and they are, they've taken 3,000 people through Mizizi, a church in Arizona. And it's being used globally. Many people are being impacted. But here's the thing that would happen. For those of you who, who took Mizizi or took people through Mizizi back in the day, you know what the statistics would look like. You take 10 people through Mizizi, right? And then when you take 10 people, they all graduate. It's a big deal. Everyone's happy. You do your cardboard testimonies, tears, tears. It's so nice. And then after that, out of the class, guess what happens? Out of the 10, three probably sign up to become understudies or become discipleship, uh, we used to call it life group, life group leaders. Three in a class of 10. Those three will continue to have a vibrant faith. Those ones, by the way, will stay connected because they're being disciples. Then about another maybe four will serve in children's ministry, ushering, etc. They won't be too bad, media team. They won't be too bad but they'll always be sheep because for them it's like I'm here to be led. I don't lead. And then another three or four, nobody would know what happened to them. They'd become members and members for life. They don't want anyone to change their life group. They want to stay the same way. So if you're looking at it as a, as a, as, as, as a shepherd because Jesus rewards us on the basis of faithfulness, you would say you have 30% success rate. Isn't it? Because out of your 10, only three have become multiplying leaders. In fact, by the way, it's so interesting. When we moved here from uh, Bellevue, and some of you know the history of this church, it was a huge move. We lost a lot of people. One thing I noticed is that three, that three out of ten, they were here. Wow. Most of our, DG, our LG leaders never fell because somebody had been working with them. The people who fell, especially that four at the end, went. That three, heavy, heavy, 50-50. This one's here stayed. So 30%. Let me tell you, 30%, according to global <laughs> percentages, we're not doing badly. It's a good, I mean, 30% is really good. Until you read Jesus' parable of the sower. And you realize that the minimum that good soil produces is not 30%. It's 30 times. 30 times is 300%. And he says 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. I read that story. I was undone. I was finished. I say, God, forgive me. The min I'm having 30% and you're asking for 300%. And you know when you read 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold, none of us say I'm a 30-fold believer. <laughs> we always identify with 100-fold. But here we are. We are at point three. Like, what are you doing? 30-fold means that in that Mizizi group, all 10 graduate and each of the three disciple three others. Wow. That's what 30-fold means. 100-fold means that each of them disciple 10 other people. Wow. No losses. That's what a 100-fold church looks like. Are you seeing the problem? Yes. How many churches we've become the, the woman. We have the silver coins and we just lose them at will. Wow. 
It's like we're just throwing them away. And for me, I could no longer have it on my conscience to be that woman. It's like we have to create a church with a hundredfold believers. I remember one of, one of the people who I really read a lot of his literature when I was thinking about discipleship. His name is Mike Breen. He's a writer of several good books on discipleship that we've used a lot of his material here. And I remember listening to an interview where he talked about, I think they've taken his church over a thousand couples through marriage preparation. This is in the UK, which is a completely liberal uh, economy, not like ours, where we're still semi-conservative. And he said, our church, in terms of divorce, we have no divorces. Zero percent divorce of the thousand couples we've taken through Ndoa, or whatever their equivalent is. Zero percent. In a culture where this divorce is rampant, you know what their secret is? Discipleship. Every single person who went through that course had another couple who walked with them for the rest of their life. Wow. They had a spiritual, they were attached to another couple, and couples, people are just discipling. You know, when you're discipling, it's like your own children, you look after them with the same passion. If one of them is about to be lost, you leave the home and you go and find them. And because of that, a church in the UK could talk about zero percent divorce rate. You know, by the way, I looked at Mavuna, I said, oh, God help us. Because that is not our statistic. It has not been our statistic. But in Jesus' name, it is changing. In Jesus' name, it is changing. We are called to be our brother's keepers. Cain asked the Lord, am I my brother's keeper? And the correct answer is, yes, you are. <laughs> Jesus did not, God didn't answer him, but the correct answer is, yes, you're your brother's keeper. If your brother's married and your DG is breaking up, it is your job. Yeah, you need to be having hard conversations before you even get to that place of breakup. But everybody needs to be in a place where they know we're not alone. We're not dying alone with this issue. Our people can help us. We have people in our church we can talk about real issues with. We have people in our church where we're not afraid to talk about our finances and the fact that we need support in this season when we don't have a job. That's what a church of discipleship does. And the lost sheep disciples are the ones who get lost because they don't have that, the lost coin. So what do we do about lost coin believers? The woman did two things. Number one, the Bible tells us she lit her lamp. And number two, she swept her house diligently until she found it. The two things every church needs to do, first of all, we must light a lamp. We must unashamedly broadcast the light of Jesus and his standards in our culture today. Yeah, we can't be wishy-washy. Guys, I know this sounds very hateful in today's culture. God hates divorce. God hates divorce. I'm, I'm, and I know I, I'm not politically correct saying this in today's culture. God hates divorce. And Jesus actually said, if you divorce your wife and then marry another woman, you've actually committed adultery. God hates divorce. We must be unashamed with the gospel. We can't be wishy-washy. Scriptures say God made them male and female in his image, not male and male. We can't be wishy-washy about the gospel. We must uphold the gospel light and not be ashamed of it. I don't have to be politically correct when it comes to saying this is the truth of God's word. This woman lit her light. The church must light its light. In the discipleship group, we must be honest and say, guys, God hates divorce. So the thing you're discussing and even thinking about, God hates it. So let's stop there. <laughs> let's have a conversation first, knowing that God hates it, before you even think about that. Let that be the last thing you ever think about. By the way, my wife and I, when we first got married, somebody counseled us, our, our, our bishop counseled us and told us, and this is something we held on. He said, it doesn't matter what happens, divorce is not an option for you as children of God. And so we say to each other, that D word, it doesn't exist in our home. We shall go through problems, we shall disagree, we shall fight, we shall do whatever it takes, but none of us is leaving. And by the way, if you leave me, I'm not leaving. Yeah. I wish she was here to testify, it's true. She knows, me, I told her, whatever you do, you do it, but me, I'm not leaving you. It's just the commitment. And that's what God, by the way, in the last generation, that's what people did. It's just in our generation that we've become covered over by the culture of the world. The woman lit the lamp, but the second thing is she swept the house. We must be willing to sweep our house of any traditions, anything that is keeping us from discipling God's people and being real in church. Anything that is keeping us from having these real conversations, we must sweep those traditions away. People don't talk about sex in church, we talk about it. 
Yeah, by the way, next, next, on Sunday, we're talking about sex in church. Some people saw the poster, they said, ah, Mavuna, you're not afraid of doing this again? I'm like, yes, we shall continue to do it. In fact, that poster which Kina Pastor Kuria produced, it is too tame. Me, I wanted a more risky one than that one. Yeah. He can tell you. He can tell you. He told me, this one is too harsh. Let me put this one. I said, I wish you had even put the first one. Yeah. People need to talk about real things in church. Let's hold up the light of Jesus and talk about these things. And then let's sweep away any traditions that are keeping us from being able to look after people in the church. If your DG group, if in your, this, this traditions of church, you know, by the way, we have too many things that keep us. We see church as just this little place. Church is actually the source of hope for the world. Yeah. I'm telling you, because you're part of this church, zero percent, none of you will divorce. Yeah. We won't let you. But I'm telling you, Pastor James and Dorcas cannot divorce while I'm here. I will slap them. Yeah. <laughs> And even you. Yeah. I, I will slap them upside the head. Slap. Uh, slap. Pastor Faith knows, by the way. Yeah. I was like, come here, sit down. What are you saying? What nonsense is I'm hearing? What are you talking about? Don't be crazy in my house. You can't leave your wife. Go and talk to her. By the way, that's how I talk to them. Because pastors have issues. But that's how I'll talk to them. I'm committed. And Pastor Caro, we're committed to them because they're our disciples. And if you are their disciples, they are committed to you in the same way. And the whole idea is that in this church, there will always be somebody who cares enough about you that they can tell you the hard things. And they're not afraid to tell you the hard things. We must be people who care for these lost coins. Because otherwise, the, those people who are getting lost in our churches will continue to get lost. This woman, she looked and she found her lost coins. May we be able to go out and find those lost coin Mavunites who are sitting in other places, by the way. Yeah. Let me tell you, by the way, once people leave Mavuno Church, they, they don't, many of them don't fit in other churches. They go and sit in the back and become pew warmers. Yeah, and they're just there lost. Some of them don't even go to church, and they're your friends. Find them. Be that woman who found them and drag them back, whatever it takes. Be un make it uncomfortable until they come back. Yeah, why, why are you letting people die on your watch? This woman, she lit her lamp, and she swept her house. Number three, the prodigal son. Third type of backslidden person. This is a person who backslid because of an independent spirit. Wow. An independent spirit. This younger son, he was once, he was very impatient to launch on his own with no regard for others. He believed it was about him. He demanded his inheritance. He rebelled against his father. He struck out on his own. And this son represents a believer who wants to receive everything on their terms from their church. She's here for summons. She enjoys the worship, but she has no commitment to the family. When things are difficult or the church is not do, do, no longer doing the things she enjoys or doing things the way she likes, she quickly exits to greener pastures. Wow. Prodigal sons, prodigal daughters use their connections with their home, with their spiritual parents and build a platform and a name for themselves, and once they have it, they strike out and become independent. This prodigal son did not want the discipline of being subject to family and to the choices of the family. In the same way, prodigal believers don't want the hassle to being, of being connected to God-given authority. They want to answer to no one. And they fail to understand that God put you in a family to learn sonship because you must be a son in order for you to be a spiritual parent as well. And so they frustrate God's purpose for them. And prodigal son, if you notice in the passage, he ended up eating with pigs. Many prodigal believers, they cut themselves off from the nutrition of the house of God that God meant for them, and they eat scraps from many other tables. Wow. And only then do they come to their senses and return to their father's house in brokenness and repentance. Ah, what must we do about prodigal son believers? And again, like I say, I have people in every one of these categories that I know. I love the father in this story that he stood outside the door every day and he waited for the son to come home wow. he waited for the son to come home he knew he couldn't force that son to come home you can't force an adult child to come home if they choose to leave you can't but the father did not shut the house and continue with business as usual the father shows the heart of God in that he stands outside the door 
and is available and is waiting and is praying and is waiting for that person to come to their senses. As a church, we must be passionate about lost people. We must create an environment that make, makes it easy for them to come back and feel at home. When this son came, the father put a robe on him, put sandals, put a ring, and slaughtered the fatted calf for him. Many times for us, when prodigals come home, we make them serve probation. And we make them sit in the corner. And we sort of make them earn their way back into the graces. That's not how the heart of God is. The heart of God is an embracing heart. He loves it when his son comes home. You notice the father actually ran out. He did a very undignified thing. He left the, he ran and met the son where he was. Fathers did not do that in those days. It was a shocking thing. But that's the heart of God. That God will never cast away a repentant sinner. He will never cast away a repentant son who comes back home. When the prodigal son returns to church, our hearts must be wide open to welcome them. Wow. And this is where we see the difference between those whose hearts are like God and the Pharisees. Because the Pharisees were very closed, close to people who are, who are far from God. Yeah, it takes time. I mean, it doesn't mean that you put them right back in the ministry where they were serving or the office. Yes, there must be a time when they also come and they learn where the house is. But we must love the prodigals. We must look for them and love them. And if they repent, they must be accepted immediately, warmly, wholeheartedly as they come back into the church. I know you're going to connect with many. They're going to be prodigal sons. Prodigal sons are coming and they're returning, by the way. In all your churches and ministries, embrace them when they come. Love on them. Ah, the Bible says the heavens throw a party when a an unbeliever comes back. When somebody who was far from God comes back, receive them with joy. Even if they caused you pain when they left. Because this father was caused a lot of pain. I mean, his business was broken up. The son said, sell everything and give me my half. So, I mean, he had actually caused financial problems for the family. But the father accepted him without any conditions. Hey, listen. May God give you the grace to accept the prodigals around you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Prodigals cause pain, but they must be accepted when they repent. This is the thing we must do. Remember, like I said, we're talking about standing firm. And the Lord is calling us to be good shepherds who not only stand firm, but help others to stand firm. Amen. Amen. The last one is the older brother. The older brother. And this one talks about mature pride. <laughs> wow. Mature pride. This is an, a backslider who does not look like a backslider. Proud, self-righteous believer who compares himself with others and feels that he has lived a better life and produced better results in ministry than others. Rather than acknowledging humbly the blessings that, and undeserved mercy of God in their lives, this son becomes proud of what he thinks he has accomplished and actually becomes angry when he's corrected. He gets angry and has a sense of entitlement. He's unhappy when younger believers are entrusted with responsibilities. Why are you giving this now, these new believers responsibilities? They need, to be, they need to earn their way, like me. <laughs> That's the implication. Um, I remember one of the things that somebody said to me is, why, Pastor Ayim, why, why are you letting people take ministries? Why are you letting people start DGs? You don't know them. And I say, yeah, I, I understand the danger. But you know, I really learned to some lessons. Back in the day when we moved from, Bellev uh, from the club to Bellevue, South Sea, uh, and I remember what happened is we actually had a growth from 400 people to 1,600 people in one month. First month, from 400 to 1,600. The next month, we had 2,400. And I still remember back in the day telling God, I don't have laborers. And God saying, yes, you do. And I remember those days we'd graduate you from Mizizi and put you to lead your own Mizizi group immediately after. Of course, there were a few things that went wrong. And I understood why Paul wrote the epistles. Because the epistles are all about Paul giving churches to new believers and then writing back and saying, Who has bewitched you? What's wrong with you guys? How is a man sleeping with his father's wife? I mean, read the epistles. That's exactly what happens. It's Paul goes somewhere, disciples, people leaves and puts them in charge and goes. And then later he comes to say, are you guys mad? That's not how we do it. And he corrected them. And so I was like, okay, I get why Paul was Paul. You know, this is, we had to do that a lot of times. 
But you know what? I also learned to trust the Holy Spirit. Wow. Yeah. The, the Holy Spirit is much more competent at training people than I am. And many of you, some of you are not, became leaders in that season. Yeah. You became leaders in that season. Is Pastor Molly here? Pastor Molly was my pastor of Mizizi at that oh, time. Pastor Pastor Mo Did you see how many people grew up? Yeah, including yourself. Yeah, people I would never have appointed in my right mind to be leaders. They became leaders because I had no leaders. And guess what happened? God grew them and they became phenomenal in the kingdom of God. Yeah, even now, by the way, there are some people who are leading discipleship groups, even churches, who would not have led churches in a regular church. <laughs> Am I talking to somebody right now? Yes. Campus pastors. Some of you know yourselves. Yes. You're like, there's no other church in this world that would appoint a guy like me to be leading a campus right now. Yeah. But you're here. And look at you impacting and affecting lives. You're blessing people. Yeah. But you see, the older, older, <laughs> the older Christians look and say, but, but, but why are you allowing someone like that to be leading? And by the way, that, that person who's asking you that is not even leading anything, by the way. But they're unhappy that you're allowing somebody else to lead it. Huh? And this person, because of their pride, they forget. They become very diff vulnerable to a different type of backsliding. They may not lose their faith, but they lose their fire. And basically what happens with them is slowly you find them moving back behind. They used to sit in the front in the hallelujah bench where even as the pastor is preaching, the speech is even touching them, anointing everywhere. Now, <laughs> now they went to the middle and then now they're at the back. And sometimes you might even find them saying, hey, this church has become a bit too excitable for us. And they start putting pressure on the pastors. You start a service for mature people like us. And if the pastor is not willing, they move to a church with a mature service for people like them, you know? And, 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 and what happens is when they move to those places, many times what happens with them is they don't have their first love. They want to just go and sit, be given a nice service, and go home. And I don't know if you notice, in, that, in all the four types of backsliders, all the first three were found, except the last one. This is the most dangerous type of backslider. That mature, proud believer is a difficult one for God to reach. And I pray, I, by the way, I pray for myself. Those days when I was a young believer and I'd see Jesus rebuking the Pharisees and the disciples would be there just, yeah. I'd feel like one of the disciples, like, any of these Pharisees, what's up with them? Nowadays when I read Jesus rebuking Pharisees, I'm like, God have mercy on me. Because for those of us who've been Christians for a long time, that's a huge danger for us. We can easily become those cold critics who are not serving, but are criticizing everybody else who is serving. What must we do about these older son believers? I love that the father patiently listened to them and shared his heart. We must take time to, to listen, to love, to empathize, to point out what we are doing. That's what the father did. You need to understand, your son has now come back. Everything is yours. You're a son of this house. But he took time. The father was not obliged to do it, but he took time to explain himself, to stay in front of them, to share his heart. We must become those people. But we must never let their discomfort become the reason why we stop making room for prodigals. So we must, we must give them an opportunity to make their decision. Because they're mature, they will make their decision. But we must pray for them that God will give them the grace to make the right decision. And so this is what I want to talk about, that all of us are responsible, every one of us. You Right now, if you think about all the people you went through the Mizizi class with, for those of you who went to Mizizi, your Ndoa class, where are those people? Are you a good shepherd who prays for them, who looks out for the lost, who is concerned to ensure that they finish well, that they're embraced in fellowship? I believe this is what God is calling us to be. Hey, listen, you must not only stand firm, you must become the one who strengthens your brother. This is what Jesus says to, to Peter. He says, you will, you will fall and you will stand. And after you have stood, strengthen your brothers. We must become those people who strengthen our brothers and sisters. We must become those anchors in our churches. I love what Pastor Simon uh, of downtown said. I'm an anchor in downtown. Ah, come on. Are you an anchor in your campus? Does your pastor know? <laughs> you might think you're an anchor, but your pastor doesn't know you're an anchor. You must become an anchor in your campus. You must be one of the ones who strengthens the weak ones. When people come and say, I don't understand why pastor so-and-so is always talking about this, you must be the one to say, come on, sit down. Let me explain to you what I hear. Don't be the one who also gets into it. Yeah, you even me. I don't even understand nowadays, Mavuno. Don't be those people. Yeah? 
Yeah, don't be those people. Be the person who says, let me explain. Let me share my heart. Get what is happening. Don't miss out. I don't want you to miss out. In fact, let's go for family night together. I want to come and hang out with you. Like, be that person who runs after the lost and brings them to Jesus. Jesus says, the Son of Man did not come to look for those who are comfortable. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And so I want to pray for us as we go for lunch. I want to pray for us that we will be good shepherds. We will be good shepherds. Every single one of us. May God move us away from that selfish, self-centered Christianity that's about me and Jesus. And begin to help us understand that all of us were created to make disciples of people. Hey, my life must be fruitful. God did not put me in my campus so I can just be there receiving sermons and sounding impressive on Sundays. God put me there so I can strengthen the faith of the people around me. Who am I discipling? Who are the people that you are raising? By the way, when I look at all of you, in fact, here's the biggest difference in culture. Back in the day when I'd look at people, I'd look at them and i see fearless influencers of society, which I, I still see even when I look. But today when I see you, I see shepherds after God's own heart. I see every single one of you a pastor. Everybody here. Because a pastor is not someone who does even what I'm doing. Stands in front and preaches to thousands. That's not the plan of a pap. A pastor is somebody who looks after God's sheep. Who is able to say, look, I may not know much, but the little I know, here it is. Let's walk together. Who parents a group of people and helps them grow and become who Jesus helps them to be. I see you all doing that in your industries. I see you doing that in your offices. I see you doing that in your neighborhoods. I see lost people coming back to Christ because of you. I see life happening because of you. You're a life giver wherever you go. I see marriages being healed because of you. I see people growing, lost sheep coming back to the Father because of you and your concern and your prayer for them. I see that wherever God places you will be a source of life. You'll always be a source of life overflowing. Wherever you go, like the Samaritan woman, you'll always overflow and people will come to Jesus because of your life. This is what I see for you. Can we just stand up right now as we conclude? I want you to pray for yourself. Just raise a voice right now and say, God, make me a good shepherd. Starting with my own family, my extended family, my children, my neighbors. Come on, just begin to raise a voice. Pray for yourself. Say, God, make me a good shepherd. Make me a discipler of nations. Increase my influence in the people around me. Help me to be passionate to see lost people coming back to you. Lord, I will not be that woman who loses all the coins that you've put in my life. I will just speak over God. Just say, God, help me. Lord, here I am. Have mercy on me. Make me a shepherd after your own heart. Father, thank you for these shepherds. Thank you for every prayer that's coming up to you right now. I bless you, Lord. I worship you, Lord. I thank you that you're going to be able to do this, Lord. Some of you right now, there's a, there's a lost sheep that is in your mind. There's someone you know that fits all these categories or some of these categories. I want you to take a minute just to pray for them right now. It might even be a family member, a brother, a sister who is lost and far from God, maybe knew God and walked away. Just take a minute and just pray for them. Say, God, help them. Begin to practice praying for this person. Just pray for them. Just call, call out. Say, Lord, I see them serving you. Lord, reach out to them. The God of this age has blinded them. I pray right now, begin to let light come into their life. Bring circumstances in their lives that would free them. Come on, I know you know someone like that. Begin to exercise love for them through your prayer. That's the first place it begins. And ask God to give you a heart to pray for them and not to give up. Some of you maybe even gave up on that person, but God is saying, I want you to continue to pray, not to give up. Men everywhere must pray. You must raise your voice on behalf of the lost. Ah, uh, God, help your people to love you. Lord, we say we love you, but you're saying to us, if you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, take care of my lambs. And I believe that this is what the Lord is saying to us today. So Father, thank you for every prayer that has come to you. I pray for you that you will be a good shepherd. You will be a good shepherd. Your Father, your Lord, your Master is a good shepherd. And it is your family, your family trait, your family DNA is good shepherding. And so I speak over you that you will be a good shepherd that God will give you a heart for those who are far from Him. I pray over you that you will be a good discipler, that the lost coins will be found in God's house because of you. I pray over you that you'll be a good father, that you're going to have a heart for the lost and the prodigals, and you will create a good environment for them to come back. 
And I pray for you that you'll be that good father who is gentle with older sons and shows the love of Jesus in every interaction. And so, Father, I just want to thank you because you're good. You're so faithful. You're so kind. I wish the worship team was here. They just help us sing that song. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. You know, I just feel that song is so powerful for us. I feel like it's a God-appointed song for us. It's a new song that these guys wrote. But I think it's so right, right on point for what God is saying to us in this season. It wasn't even last season's word. And this song was written before we even knew what the season was about. Before God gave us the word, unshakable. But it's so relevant for us. Come on, lead us in that. If you love me, would you feed my land? If you love me, take care of my sheep. Come on, sing it, let's go. Lord, if you love me, Lord, fill my lambs. And if you love me, take care of my sheep. If you One of the things, I, one of the ways I see that God expresses his love for us is that he has given us his word. Because I always feel like God could have left us to fumble in the dark yeah. in our attempt to find him. Yeah. But he loved us so much and he desires us to connect with him so much he, he, that, that he makes it, he teaches us, he shows us how to honor him, how to love him, how to serve him. And so here is a very clear instruction on how we express our love to God. He says, if you love me, feed my sheep. And I just sense that God is inviting us to a place of commitment or recommitment to serve him by being disciple makers. And so I just want to invite you to come before the Lord as we're singing this song in this moment and just make that commitment before the Lord. One of the risks you run in a moment like this because it's deep and it's inspiring is of making a commitment lightly. That's not what this invitation is. This is an invitation to say, I will pay the price to feed your sheep. I will do what it, whatever it will cost me, I will pay that price. I am available to suffer inconvenience, to suffer whatever price lord you may ask me to pay the cost of loving people who may not be easy to love the cost of covering ground because i'm reaching for a sheep that was lost and 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 my temptation is to say but how did it even get lost why didn't it just open its eyes and follow me to pay that price to say i will go where i need to go and so i just want you to pray for yourself and I want you to come before the Lord and just say, Lord, I'm, I, I, I want to commit myself to this invitation. I want you to say yes to the Lord and to say, this is my life. I want to make this an anchor for me. I want to anchor my life in serving you by making disciples. I will be that good shepherd who goes after the one and leaves the 99. So just lift up your voice uh, and say this prayer before the Lord. 
uh, if this is your commitment, you know, you're making it for the first time, maybe you've never thought about it, you haven't actively been looking to make disciples, you're making this commitment for the first time, I'm inviting you to do it. But maybe for some of us, for many of us, probably it's a recommitment. It's saying, Lord, I have said this before. I'm saying it again. I will do what you have asked me to do. I will be a feeder, a person who takes care of your sheep. I will be a disciple maker. Let's just come before the Lord and whisper that prayer. My God and my King, I commit myself. I'm committing myself to be a maker of disciples. I refuse to be comfortable with people around me lost, with people around me on the path to destruction. I declare that I am available to you. My God and my King, the, the, the things that I have held back or the things that have held me back, I am rejecting them right now in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody needs to let go of their comfort right now. That's the barrier for you. The barrier for you uh, is, is that you're not very comfortable i don't know hosting you're not very comfortable you're introverted you don't make friends easily uh, my discomfort i can share this uh, my discomfort is because i you know i love people and i love to be happy with people my discomfort is when people are going astray i struggle to correct family and to declare with clarity that this is the right way those are the things that god is inviting us to die to that my god and my king i refuse to watch someone get lost because it's hard for me to have a tough conversation i am declaring that i will be committed to reaching the lost sheep for your sake to correcting those who are wrong to helping them follow jesus in the way that they should our god and our king we are making this commitment I just sense that we need to, 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 to say this challenge and not out of pressure, so please don't feel pressure. But if your, your response to this challenge from Pastor M is here I am, Lord, I am available, let me invite you to raise your hand so that we can pray together and make this commitment. This is not an idle invitation. It's not an idle invitation for me. I can, I can sense in this moment that this is a thing that God is saying, are you in? Are you committed to do this? Are you committed to do it when it will be easy and when it will be hard? Are you committed to do it when it will be inconvenient and when it will be costly? And if your answer to this invitation is yes, I want us to say this prayer together and just declare that here we are, Lord. We are available to be sent where you want to send us. We are available for the assignments to which you want to appoint us. Our God and our King, we thank you. It is our privilege to serve you. Any price we can pay in service to you, Lord, it is our privilege to pay it. Any sacrifice we can make in honoring you, it is our privilege to make it. And so even as your word has come with clarity and with conviction, our God and our King, we are raising up our hand and saying, here am I, Lord. I am available. I am saying that I love you, Lord. I want to take care of your sheep. I want to feed your sheep. I want to align and realign my life so that I can bring glory and honor to your name. So that Jehovah, King of glory, many people can come to the knowledge of you because of me. Our God and our King, we are saying that we are available. As we make this commitment, Lord, we refuse for this to be uh, an idol commitment and easy or cheap raising of hands oh God we are declaring that we are saying here we are Lord we are committing to pay the price we are committing to do whatever it is that you will call us to do in this in this great commission of making disciples I speak a blessing over your children Lord I release upon you the grace to uh, be effective and phenomenal disciple makers in the mighty name of Jesus Christ my God and my King I recognize that to every life here there are destinies that are connected to us there are people that you're looking to redeem through us in the name of Jesus Christ I declare that as we are faithful in the making of this Every destiny that you have connected to us, every life that you have appointed to be redeemed through us and our faithfulness, I declare that it will happen in Jesus' name. I declare, my Father and my God, that this will not just be for destinies, but for the generations that will come out of them. For generations of spiritual sons and daughters, for the generations of, of physical 
daughters, are boys and children and girls who will be raised by men and women that you will give us the opportunity and even young people that you will give us the opportunity to disciple. We declare Jehovah King of Glory that as we are faithful in the assignment that you are calling us to, everything that you intend for us to accomplish in our lives, we declare that it shall be done. We declare that your kingdom will come, that your will will be done in the mighty, all-powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All God's people said, Amen. 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 I just, as Pastor James was leading us, I just sense that there's some people here who for some reason or the other, maybe you've just not, not been asked or maybe you've just not felt you're the person. But today you're sensing, I do want to lead a discipleship group. You've heard people talking about it before. Some of the things he talked about maybe were the thing, I'm not comfortable with people, I don't have a house that's big enough, I don't have this or that. But today you've had a very clear challenge. And you're saying, I do, I will lead a discipleship group by God's grace. And if you're here, I'm going to ask you to do a very bold thing. Uh, just come up to the front and we'll just do one last prayer before we go for lunch. And so, so come up. I know there are people here, maybe you've even been asked before and you've been reluctant for some reason, but today is the day you have understood. This is one of the ways I show my love for God, is by feeding a sheep. Come, 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 come. Many of you. Come, 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 come. Yeah, yeah, come, 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 come. come, come. There's more people, I know. They're yeah, there. Just come. People are waiting for you. There are lost sheep waiting for you. Your yes unlocks the destinies of people. So come up. Come on, we can celebrate them better than that. Wow, wow, wow. Amen. Amen. Uh, I just, I sense that I should say to you two things. Number one, this will cost you. So this is not an invitation to a cheap or an easy sacrifice. That's not what we are being invited to. And so I want you to understand that this will cost you. But the second thing I want you to understand is that some of the most significant promises in scripture, they exist in the context of making disciples. That's Jesus promising us his presence and his power. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He says, I will be with you always until the end of the age. In the middle is as you make disciples. So that promise exists for you as you're faithful in making disciples. He says, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit will come upon you to be my witnesses. It's in the process of raising spiritual children and followers of Jesus. These promises exist in the context of making disciples. So let me invite you to stretch your hands out in front of you as I speak a blessing over you. Our God and our King, we thank you for the invitation to be fruitful, to multiply uh, your values, your nature, your, your influence through the process of making disciples. I thank you, Lord, for, we thank you for each of these people who have stood up and are saying, here am I, Lord, send me. We thank you for their availability. In the name of Jesus, we pray. You've given us such a powerful word throughout this month of January. May they have the testimony of Joshua, that as they stepped out in this, in this journey, that you have invited them as disciple makers. May they testify that they found you had already gone ahead of them. May they testify that the commander of the Lord's army had already obtained for them victory at every turn. Our God and our King, would you cause them to raise up mighty men and women in the kingdom of God who will have a strong spiritual heritage and who will spread the gospel to the glory and to the honor of your name. We pray that you will cause these ones to be planted and anchored here in the their church family, Jehovah King of Glory, as you're using them to establish others in their faith and in their commitment to you, all to the glory 
and to the honor of your name. As they have raised their hand up, Holy Spirit of God, would you give them the grace to be bold? Would you give them the grace to be faithful? Would you give them the grace to overcome every challenge that the enemy will bring their way? We declare that discouragement will be defeated in their lives. That when the enemy will whisper in their ear, when they will call people and they won't show up, they will receive the boldness and the courage to say, I have committed to serve the Lord and nothing will keep me down. That my God and my King, any attack the enemy brings their way, they will be unshakable in their faith, they will be determined to honor you, and they will push forth by faith like we prayed this morning in the assignment that you have called them to. We thank you for every testimony that is connected to this commitment. The testimonies of salvation, testimonies of spiritual inheritance for sons and daughters who will come out of this decision and this commitment to serve you in the area of spiritual parenting. We command every blessing in the heavenly realms upon your sons and daughters. As they serve you, our God and our King, we declare that your favor, your grace, your anointing is their portion. Yes. As they go about your business, would you be about their business? Would you wage war on their behalf and give them victory on every side? We declare that it is done in the mighty and all-powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen, Amen, Amen. amen. Come on, let's celebrate these guys.